My name is John Tiro. I'm a principal product manager with AWS, and I'm responsible for Greengrass. And today we're going to talk a bit about what is Greengrass and why is it important, talk about what's new, and you'll hear from some of our customers and partners what it is that they're building on top. And I hope you'll find it as exciting, find it as exciting as we do. So what is Greengrass? AWS Greengrass extends AWS from the cloud onto your own devices so that the devices can act locally in response to the data that they collect and they generate while still taking advantage of the cloud. Put a little bit more simply, Greengrass lets you process data where you want to. Anywhere between the cloud and the edge. And when we say that, we talk about four features that Greengrass offers. With Greengrass, you can execute event-based compute functions, known as Lambda functions, that are authored in the cloud and deployed down onto your devices. Execute them physically on your own devices. We support local triggers or messaging. So you can exchange data between Lambda functions and devices and peripherals on the same local network without need of transiting via the cloud. We support sync and conflict resolution of state via device shadows and AWS grade security that works on a local network to the same security bar as we offer with AWS in the cloud. And we announced Greengrass here in reInvent one year ago, and we've been frankly astonished at the breadth of use cases that customers and partners are bringing to us across industries. Industrial gateways for manufacturing and logistics, consumer gateways and consumer devices, connected automotive vehicles, connected wireless infrastructure, energy, agriculture, insurance, medical, mining, almost any industry you can think of. And in specifics here, some of the customers and partners who we're proud to share that they've allowed to share our names and some of the details about what it is that they're building. And this list is continuing to grow. Now across all, these, across all these customers and all these partners and all these industry verticals, we see a few benefits that pop up again and again. Why is it important to do local execution with Greengrass? Well, first, you can respond extremely quickly to local events without need of transit to the cloud because your signal doesn't need to bounce off the cloud anymore. Instead, it can travel inches or feet at the speed of light. Your devices can operate offline and have the same behavior when disconnected as they do when they're fully connected to the cloud. You can program your devices with a simple or shall we say modern device programming model based on Lambda with modern deployment tools, modern CI and workflow. And you no longer have to use <clears throat> embedded languages just to manipulate the behavior of your connected devices. You can reduce the cost of your IoT applications because you can pre-process the huge volumes of data that your devices generate and collect at the edge and upload only the most valuable bits to the cloud. And you, with this, you get the benefit of Amazon's very heavy investment in security that continues. So we want to talk about why this is important. We're going to have to go back to that question I raised on the first and second slide. Where do I want to process data? For every use case that involves a connected device, as a developer, as an OEM, as an enterprise, you have a choice to make for each use case. 
whether you want to process each bit of data way out at the edge or way in the cloud. And the choices you make will be very specific to the problem you're trying to solve, but there are three patterns that pop up again and again. We call them laws because we think they'll hold even as technology improves. The first is the law of physics, which says light only travels so fast. And if you need a signal, if you need a response <clears throat> faster than light can travel to the nearest cloud data center, guess what? You're going to have to make a decision all by yourself. It's the law of physics. The second is the law of economics, which says data has weight and transmitting it costs money. And if you have very high volumes of data, you're going to have to make cost-benefit trade-offs and summarize and filter data, which sometimes means destroying data before you've looked at it, which can be a tragedy from the perspective of people like us who like to add value to data. And the third law is the law of the land, which says there are non-technical reasons why I'd like to control where my bits physically travel. These can be actual laws of data sovereignty, they can be regulations, or they can be policies of safety and security and privacy. And when we talk about these laws, we've talked about them in the sense that they challenge use cases that might obviously be driven fully by the cloud, and they push processing towards the edge. It turns out, though, that the three laws work in both directions. Just as the law of physics says you are going to want to do some processing at the edge to be highly responsive, it says that data gets more valuable when it sits next to other data in the cloud. And just as the law of economics says it costs money to move data around and transit it up to the cloud, it also says that some of the cheapest hardware resources you'll find will be in the cloud. Transit versus hardware. And there are regulations and laws that say you'd like to have control over where your data is stored and, and managed as well. So there is a spectrum of choices that you're going to have to make for every use case. And this is AWS. So what we like to do is we like to give you a granular set of tools so you can choose the right position on that spectrum for every use case. And when you look at it this way, including some of the announcements that we made this morning, we've got a pretty broad array between the edgiest edge of a constrained light bulb IoT endpoint based on a microcontroller and the cloud core. We have four products that let you use one common programming model, one common set of skills and experience and context to write applications that put together multiple pieces in this spectrum. And today we're going to talk about how Greengrass can let you choose the right increments in what we'll call the middle section of this map of the edge between individual gateways all the way up to infrastructure. And Greengrass lets you apply that common programming model in those localities. So let's talk about some choices of where you're going to process data and why that's important. I'm pleased to invite up Lee Bauer, who's a vice president with Delphi Automotive. I don't know if you can hear me, yeah. So we're not here to talk about uh, light bulbs. We have a massive uh, IoT issue. Uh, we came on John actually trying to solve our particular problem. So just a little bit about Delphi first, soon to be named Aptiv. Uh, we're basically a pure play end-to-end uh, -end electrical architecture. We call it from sensor to cloud. And it breaks it down into three really technology verticals, uh, data and power. 
So we do both signal and power distribution uh, in vehicle, so not just automotive, but also uh, over the road and, and even some agricultural products. Where we're heading is centralized compute, or what we like to call aggregate compute. It's how you take a look at a transportation uh, uh, product and then look at the compute in aggregate and how do you orchestrate that compute. Uh, the, leg the largest compute area that we have is obviously autonomous driving and how to manage uh, an autonomous vehicle, autonomous fleet uh, in its various use cases and contexts, uh, and then connected services. So originally con connected services was about keeping the car connected uh, to deliver a new set of value, but the reality is actually changing. The car, when it becomes autonomous, cannot be unconnected. So it has to have what we call some hybrid functionality where it works with the infrastructure or the edge. I'll introduce a new phrase today on that, uh, as well as uh, with the cloud. So this is the key slide. The, the biggest problem that we're facing today is really shown here in the bottom left. One vehicle generates 40 terabytes an hour of data, uncompressed. So with our best practices today, we've got it down to really about two to four terabytes an hour. So that works great when you've got five or 10 cars. When you start to deploy a fleet, uh, it becomes unmanageable. So we had this problem statement, and that's how we ended up uh, with, with John. So our problem is the law of physics and the law of economics. The physics don't work. So in many cases with our vehicles, we actually transport the data physically. We have so much data, we don't know what to do with it. Uh, and that's where the concept is, how does the edge work? And really, what is the edge? At the same time, which is a positive trend, is the amount of compute power. If we look back five or 10 years, none of us ever envisioned that we would have this level of compute power and be able to deploy it in vehicle. So the combination of the two, we have the data on the one side, we have a massive ability to uh, compute at part of the edge, but then you also have to transfer it to we call it edge-to-edge -edge compute. So in order for us to really manage our, our vehicles, we know one thing, and that's the first point here, is automated driving must have cloud control. When, you're, when you have tools and rules being sent down, we just saw today uh, uh, with, with GM's vehicle got stuck behind a taco truck because it couldn't recognize that that car was parked and that vehicle was actually serving people so it didn't know how to get around. So you need a rule that when you see a taco truck and people standing there, you, you have to uh, deploy uh, a rule to get around it. So the in-vehicle data exceeds the ability to process locally. So what it's forcing us to do is to marry that up with the edge. So in this case, it's infrastructure. So the way that we parse out our in infrastructure is by region, and by context, so every vehicle works in a specific region, it's controlled by a specific piece of infrastructure, uh, and then the vehicle itself is the context. The debate on where to process is, is really about the economics. So we have the physics, we have too much, and the economics, if we were to try to move it all, it doesn't work. So for us, microservices was the key. The ability to have a unified architecture, so it's one thing making a car drive itself, but it's another how to manage it with the cloud. So what we wanted to have was a consistent, unified language from the vehicle to the edge and to the cloud. And that's what uh, uh, Greengrass brings us. So in short, what we can do, and we've announced some new uh, resources and some new uh, uh, extensions today, where we can access the sensors. We can use the sensors for intervention. We can use the sensors for panic. Uh, we can use the sensors for uh, uh, Context, contextual awareness. So with Green Gas, it allows us to do that. Once we do that, bring it to the edge, we can actually then aggregate these tiles, if you will, of how we manage the vehicle in its geography and in its context, and push down then ultimately new rules to the vehicle so that it can avoid taco trucks in the future or whatever else might come. And for us, the way to deploy it gives us the balance between the edge and the compute. So where we're looking at it, we see green grass as an essential component to allow us to deliver user experience. Automated driving, first and foremost, is about user experience. 
If it works, people will use it, but it has to work. So it's a circular reference in that context. So we, we're going to deploy it in the user experience, for sure, in our central compute. Uh, edge processing, absolutely. Uh, we see the edge processing uh, being the critical element and our ability also to send down uh, new rules and even asks of the system to deliver it back to the cloud. And obviously monitoring and control. When you have these products in the field, there's really two critical things you have to address. One is ridership, the experience of the person who, who is using the automated service. Uh, and, and the other one is the asset itself. Is the asset available? Are the right people in the asset? And does it handle itself properly going from A to B? So with that, I'll turn it over to John for the next one. Thank you. Check, check. Okay. So thanks a lot, Lee. I think we're going to see a theme today of choices that are getting made to process data in places along the spectrum. And Delphi is doing exciting work. So Lee promised us new features. Greengrass has, uh, has evolved in the years since we announced it. And we're, we're pleased to announce some extensions to what it is that we've previously had available. Let's get right into it. First is something we actually announced about six weeks ago, which is an extension to the development languages that we support in Lambda on Greengrass. We launched with Python support. And with the new edition of Greengrass, you can also author Lambda functions in Node.js and in Java. This gives you more tools. You can also now add a new kind of logic, a new kind of business rule into Greengrass in the form of machine learning inference, which is launching today in preview. Let's talk about that. Now, machine learning has two pieces to it. There is training. And there's inference. Training is based on historical data and needs infinite compute to generate predictive models that can be applied to new data. Those predictive models are called inference models. They get applied to new data and make predictions based on the historical training data. And there is a problem here, because training and inference need different things. Training needs infinite compute, and inference needs infinite data. With ML inference on Greengrass, you can do something new, which is you can pull those things apart. You can let the training data be happy with infinite compute, the training model. And you can let the inference model be happy with infinite data out at the edge. Deploy that down to Greengrass and run it physically out in the world. And when you've done that, you can even create a virtuous cycle where the inference model supplies new training data up to the cloud, and new training models get generated and deployed down to Greengrass and get smarter over time. And we're seeing an explosive, <clears throat> an explosive set of use cases for this. Some of the popular ones that have already come up, image recognition, voice and sound recognition, avoiding collisions, detecting anomalies. There's lots more. So that's Greengrass, <coughs> Greengrass machine learning inference at the edge. And that's available in preview today. 
Greengrass ML inference relies on a, a deeper feature which is now also available in Greengrass for all developers, which is called local resource access. And what local resource access does is it lets you extend the common programming model, the Lambda functions that you deploy down to Greengrass, and lets them interact with the underlying capabilities of the host device, a GPU, a sensor, an actuator, a bus. And in this way, your Lambda functions that are written in the cloud and deployed down to your devices can actually start to interact with the devices and with the physical environment around them. Any device, camera, arm, peripheral, any storage volume on the host device, your Lambda functions can now natively interact with those. And it's easy to use. What you do is you declare a local resource to become available to your Greengrass Lambdas by defining the path. Devices under slash dev can show up. <clears throat> and you can point to other locations as well for storage volumes. And so, for example, if I'm deploying a machine learning inference model down to Greengrass, I can now take advantage of a GPU to accelerate how fast I run those predictive models. And Greengrass can actually take advantage of what is special about the hardware that you're running on, not just the, the physical location that it happens to have close to the data. So this is really exciting. Another feature that we're launching today is support for an industrial messaging protocol which is called OPC UA. Now, OPC UA is a popular exchange protocol that is used in factories and transportation and logistics and more. And it defines the way that devices in, for example, a factory are meant to interact with one another. And a lot of customers have told us that in an industrial context, when you want to start taking advantage of Greengrass, Greengrass will not be the only device that is active in that environment. And so if you want to use Greengrass, you're going to want to let it talk to devices that are already deployed, already speaking whatever protocol it is that they're speaking. And OPC UA is a very popular one. So with the new OPC UA adapter for Greengrass, Greengrass can interact with existing fleets of devices that speak OPC UA. They can do it in a way that's highly secure with certificate-based mutual authentication between Greengrass and the local OPC server. <clears throat> and the implementation that we provide is fully customizable by you. Because what we've learned is enterprises and developers who use protocols like OPC UA get very particular about how it's configured. Now, in fact, OPC UA is one very important protocol, but there's what we've called an infinite tail of possible messaging standards that customers might like to use. Some of them may be standard, some of them may be custom or proprietary or legacy. And what you'll be able to see in the way that we implemented our OPC UA adapter is a lot of this translation between protocols can happen with Lambda functions. Any TCP IP based protocol can be translated by feeding messages into a Lambda function that defines how they should be transformed. There are also protocols that are not TCP IP, uh, not TCP IP based. For example, they may require a special bus or a special radio. And in this way, you can take advantage of local resource access to talk directly to the driver or the bus that feeds in the information and get it to a place that the Lambda function can start transforming it. So between local resource access and Lambda functions, you can implement a very wide set of protocols, which can include very exotic ones. And you'll see more protocol adapters from Amazon over time. 
But we also expect that a lot of the protocols that you're going to want to implement may be entirely custom to you. And so we're, we're making it possible to use the very same framework that we use ourselves uh, in, your own, in your own implementations. Next, let's talk about green grass and how, it's, how it gets better over time. When we launched green grass, we said there are two ways, the first two on this chart, to update green grass. You can use messaging to change, to uh, synchronize the data and trigger events on your device. And you can use deployments to send down new Lambda functions, new configuration, resources, subscriptions. But the underlying Greengrass core, that's what needs to change if you want to take advantage of new features, bug fixes, and security enhancements over time. And we intend to iterate and improve Greengrass rapidly, just as we've done so far. So with Greengrass over-the-air updates, we've now made that easy. We want you to update Greengrass so you can take advantage of all the new features and bug fixes and security enhancements that we're going to provide. The two key things to know are that you're in control. <laughs> we will not update Greengrass without your explicit instruction to do that but instead are providing tools that you can choose to use if, you, if that's what you want to do. And in addition, we version the updates in such a way that you can understand what it is you're getting into. You can set, you can make different decisions based on major versus minor versus patch level updates. And this is available today. Andy announced in his keynote this morning something called Amazon Free RTOS, which is an extension and set of libraries on top of the popular and battle-tested Free RTOS kernel, which is the number one real-time OS for microcontrollers. And it's used today in, in an astonishing set of use cases, including satellites and cars and coffee pots. Well, FreeRTOS and Amazon FreeRTOS and Greengrass are best friends. An Amazon FreeRTOS device out of the box can connect locally to AWS Greengrass and be part of an AWS Greengrass group to exchange messages and trigger Lambda functions, synchronize shadows and proxy messages. Amazon FreeRTOS also is designed to work really well with AWS IoT Cloud and follows the very same security best practices that, that uh, we use on Greengrass and in the cloud. So we're really excited about this. Now referring back to the four features I discussed at the beginning of this presentation, we're actually expanding pretty quickly. And it's, it's really encouraging to see the, the pace of innovation that our customers, the people in this room, are pulling out of us by bringing great use cases to us that are wide and varied. So let's talk about another use case that's a little different from the automotive scenario we saw before. Uh, Warby Parker. And today we've got Adam Zatrowski, who's a senior software engineer with Warby. He's going to talk a little bit about, a little bit about Greengrass at Warby. Say hi, everyone. Hi, folks. <clears throat> hi there. Um, so I'm a, Adam Zatrowski. I'm a senior software engineer at Warby Parker, uh, and I'm a tech lead on our retail tech team. Um, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about why we're excited about uh, Amazon Greengrass and how it fits into how we think about uh, technology in our retail stores. So first, a little bit about Warby Parker. Um, we were founded in 2010 after one of our founders uh, lost his $700 pair of glasses on an airplane. And uh, he and his friends from school got together and thought, you know, a piece of technology that's been around for hundreds of years shouldn't cost as much as a new iPhone. Uh, and as you may know, the eyewear industry is dominated by a few major big players. 
Uh, and so they set out to disrupt that industry by offering amazing quality glasses at a revolutionary price online. Um, not long after that, we expanded out of um, our e-commerce and home try-on program and into brick-and-mortar retail stores. We've opened uh, 60 across the country in Canada. Um, and we set out to deliver the same amazing experience uh, in our stores that we were offering online. And uh, in order to deliver that experience, we've leveraged technology really heavily in our stores, uh, leading us to do things like develop our own custom point-of-sale software. Uh, in addition to that, you know, we really place a lot of importance on using data to inform almost every decision that we make. Um, and so to that end, we've been you know, really accustomed to using really robust uh, analytics platforms that are available for the web for a long time now. Uh, and so we set out to develop a platform uh, to generate analytics and insights in our retail stores to allow us to, um, to inform our decisions. So we, we, want, you know, we want to paint a picture of customer behavior in our stores, uh, from the traffic that comes in to where customers are aggregating in the stores, uh, where they're dwelling, and uh, you know, which products are getting picked up off the shelves more than um, others. And so this allows us to um, paint uh, you know, a really vivid picture and inform those crucial decisions like um, where we place our advisors in the stores, how we merchandise our frames, or uh, how are we uh, improving our technology systems and can we measure that in a meaningful way. <clears throat> and so this is where Greengrass comes in. Um, we've been using AWS for a really long time. We use it for everything that we do uh, for in the cloud. And um, in particular, we really love using Lambda. Uh, we use it for everything from provisioning user accounts to uh, order routing and logistics. And um, <clears throat> Greengrass allows us to leverage that same paradigm on the edge. Uh, and it allows us to take advantage of the features that we really love, such as, cho such as choice of language, um, the event-driven programming model, and uh, the uh, really easy deployment scheme that it provides. And so all of this together allows us to uh, use Greengrass to do all the heavy lifting when it comes to uh, generating analytics. We can take sensor data that's deployed, uh, that from our sensors deployed in the stores, consume lots and lots of sensor data in the Greengrass core and have Greengrass aggregate that data so that we're condensing it and distilling it so that we're only shipping the meaningful bits up to the cloud. Uh, after all, almost all of that sensor data is basically worthless after uh, just a few moments, and so uh, we can ship just the meaningful stuff that we care about. And even with the high-speed internet connections at our stores, it doesn't make sense to ship gigabytes and gigabytes of data up over the wire. And um, it doesn't hurt that Greengrass allows us to make this system really resilient to internet connectivity issues. In short, Greengrass allows us to process more data more quickly, iterate rapidly, and uh, get to insights faster. So thanks so much. I'll hand it back to John. Thanks, Adam. Really cool. So we spoke about some new features of Greengrass, and you'll see more of those. But another trend that's been, that's been popping up with Greengrass is that our customers and our partners want to run it in new environments. You've already seen, for example, an expansion in the set of Linux distributions that we support, starting with classic distributions of Linux like Ubuntu and Amazon Linux, and expanding into Linux distributions that are constrained, meant for gateways, meant for hardened environments like Yocto, like OpenWRT, Wind River. But our customers are telling us they want more. They want more options. They want more flexibility about how to deploy Greengrass and in what environments it can run. So I have some new things to share. The first is support for easily deploying Greengrass in a Docker container and deploying it down into your, new, into your own devices. And this has been a huge ask for customers. You can expect to see it coming soon to AWS Labs, which is our, our open source repository. <clears throat> With the Greengrass Docker recipe, you can very easily deploy Greengrass core onto your own devices into a Docker, into a Docker environment. That's coming soon. Yet another option. That's going to be very exciting for 
a number of our customers is deploying Greengrass into a virtual machine in a VMware vSphere environment. What you're going to get is a packaged VM image in an OVA file that can share local resources uh, within the host device, that lets Greengrass interact with other VMs in that environment, and with the VMware control plane. So that you can actually bring the power of this common programming model into some of the, the uh, VM-based IT environments that already exist. So let's talk about what that means and why it's important. I'm pleased to invite Chris Wolf, who's a vice president with VMware, and can talk about Greengrass on vSphere. Thanks, John. We got the handheld because this is like a mic drop moment. So I just got to decide the right moment to drop this thing, and uh, you know we'll go from there. All right, we think this is a, this is we think this is a pretty big deal, and I want to just jump into the use cases that have been driving this. Uh, this is, Edge is an area at VMware I've been focused on for about the last 15 months, and for me personally, what I've been meeting with customers and uh, most customers that have any experience at all with AWS Lambda were like, "Wait a minute, why don't we? Why don't you two get together and, and do some make this easier for us?" For most of you, you already have compute capacity out at the edge. And when I'm thinking about using things or, or bringing new technologies like machine learning through green grass to the edge, why not take advantage of the compute capacity you already have in these places? Right? This, this gives you a lot more flexibility. It allows you to do a lot more powerful things with green grass than you've already been able to do today. And that's something that we think is really exciting. Now, just to, just to hit on some of the use cases that we see, and I know John's alluded to a lot of these, you know, things like transaction execution time. Sometimes it's just not practical to go out to a cloud and uh, get a meaningful response back in enough time. Right? Uh, having data locale or sovereignty is also issues that we see quite a bit. It's just easier to move the cloud service and the intelligence to the point of data creation than to try to move the data to the point of where my intelligence might be. Again, there's always there's nuances here. It's not written in stone, but the, the flexibility need is certainly there. And sometimes it's networking constraints, whether it be like the oil and gas industry as an example, uh, poor connectivity, or just simply not having a large enough pipe, or even if I could get that pipe, it just costs too much. So maybe I should do some of these things local, and then maybe I'm doing some more deeper learning and analytics further out in the cloud. And you know, finally, other areas that we see quite a bit of is around privacy and control. You know, I want to have segmented off environments. I want to be able to have a full audit trail that's in an environment that I fully know and understand. And maybe, maybe even if I could do this in the cloud, my auditors are a little bit more conservative, so I want to appease them. And for some of our customers, especially in manufacturing, you know, having the capability to even run some of these in more of a disconnected mode where they don't always want their factories you know, fully cloud connected all the time, or at least having those options are really important to them. You know, the bottom line here is the way we look at it, when we did VMware Cloud on AWS, it was about taking hybridity in one direction, taking some of your apps that are already running on VMware and get to start to integrate them with some native AWS services and really improve the capabilities. So what we're doing here is taking hybridity in the other way. Take your AWS services into your VMware environments and allow you to get some additional capability and flexibility there. So that's, that's the gist of what we're doing here and why it's important. You know, for you selfishly, there's some pretty interesting things that you can do here as well. So if it runs on VMware, it can run on anything that runs VMware. So you're fu running Fusion on your MacBook Pro. If I want to go ahead and use local resource access and connect a camera or a different sensor to my MacBook and just test Lambda, you can do it on your MacBook. Again, pretty cool uh, capabilities and flexibility. Now what I'd like to show you is the preview that we have of uh, AWS Greengrass on VMware vSphere. We're going to have this available very, very soon. Uh, and this will be based on, on 1.3. We're just doing some final testing on the engineering side, and we'll have that online and available for you. So what I'd like to go, do is go ahead and get into it. This is just using our CLI. So we're doing a GovC import of the OVA files. This is just a standard template file to bring a VM into a VMware environment or a VM template and deploy from it. Now, I'm going to see that in the web UI. I could do all this from a CLI or API. But again, I'm just giving you something else to look at here for a minute. Let's break it up a little bit. We're running Greengrass on Ubuntu server right now. And what you're seeing is the Ubuntu server instance boot up. And once that finishes, what you're going to see is we have Greengrass already uh, available in the local file system. So we're going to go ahead and log in now as the administrator. And what we're going to see, you'll see that Greengrass is deployed. So let's go ahead and we're going to switch out of that. 
Now we're gonna go a little bit further because now what we're gonna need to do, we're gonna have to import our certificates and our configuration to go ahead and, and finally start the Greengrass environment. So that's what you're going to see here. So let's go ahead and unpack and import our certificates. And once that's done, we're going to be able to go ahead and start Greengrass. So again, what we're trying to do is make this a very simple, very easy way for you to get Greengrass into environments and infrastructure and capacity that you already have, and then go from there. You know, and furthermore, we're seeing a lot of use cases where organizations want to have their Lambda functions interact with other aspects of their VMware environments, such as interact with local databases and local file systems. So now once we're here, we're, we're going to go ahead and deploy the Greengrass group into the new Greengrass core instance that we've deployed out at the edge on uh, VMware. So that's the deployment happening here. This is one of the final steps of the process. Once that's done, we can actually start to do some pretty interesting things. So the last part of the demo, what we're showing and what we've been testing at VMware is, in, is the capabilities for Lambda functions to interact with physical resources. So through VMware vSphere, we can uh, connect these resources to local GPUs. We can connect them to, uh, in the case of the camera, we're configuring a local video camera so that what we're going to do is we're going to kick off a Lambda function using MQTT to do a capture. So we can capture uh, the image from that, we can resize the image, and we're writing that back to the local file system. So again, Greengrass, Lambda functions on Greengrass, on VMware, interacting with local hardware at the edge. This is allowing you, again, to share some of the edge capacity that you already have, and again, expand some of those capabilities and, ha and be able to leverage more powerful compute uh, for anything that you would want to do on Greengrass. What do you think? Come on, right? All right, thank you. John, back to you. Thanks, Chris, for the super cool demo. So new environments, right? Talked about Greengrass living in a gateway, in a retail environment. We talked about Greengrass living in a vehicle. We talked about Greengrass living in a server appliance. But what if Greengrass needs to operate in a really extreme environment where connectivity is expensive or nearly unavailable? Well, for that, we actually have partners and customers who are beginning to implement Greengrass in wireless infrastructure networks, private LTE, 5G, other kinds of wireless infrastructure. So let's hear about some of that work that's happening from Nokia. And I'm pleased to invite Marco Hokonan from Nokia. Yep, my name is Marco Hockren. I'm working as an solution architect. And, and this is the first uh, project uh, between Nokia and AWS uh, Greengrass team, uh, what I'm presenting to you. Okay, yep. Over here you can see that um, what is our proof of concept, which is actually uh, available over there in the, the builders area. Over here you can see uh, what is this actual solution. On the left-hand side you can see that uh, we are using uh, Oculus VR headset, so this is virtual rea reality demonstration. And this um, uh, headset is connected uh, uh, on the internet to uh, citizens broadband radio services, LTCPC. So actually you heard already uh, uh, from John that the, now they are coming like a new uh, wireless technologies. It is called a private LTE. If you want to build up nowadays um, LTE network, you need to have a license uh, and only carriers has the license because it's so extremely expensive to own the spectrum. But now they are coming like new technologies and this citizens broadband radio services, it is the LTE technology and it will be available for the US market in the first half, first half 2018 and Nokia is providing a, a connectivity solution over there. And, and over here, this 
over here in this demonstration, we are connecting this VR headset through the CPRS LTE with the CPE to Nokia provided CPRS LTE small cell. And over there, uh, we have a Dell Edge server where we are running all, all these applications. All these applications, what you can see over here, are virtualized. Over here, we have Nokia virtualized multi-access edge computing. This makes possible that we can do this network edge deployment. Then we have a local breakout functionality. This is also from Nokia. And, and this makes possible that we can route the traffic for the uh, right applications which are located in the network edge. Over here, we have integrated AWS Greengrass on the same Dell Edge server. And over here, we have also the Nokia Virtual Evo Packet Core. So over here, you can see that we have a uh, whole uh, end-to-end LTE network. Then we have a connection uh, through the internet to AWS Cloud, where we have these main uh, IoT services. And on this uh, solution, you can see that Nokia is providing this CPRS LTE radio, uh, um, uh, virtual MEC LPO, and virtual core network. Amazon is providing AWS Greengrass Core, AWS Greengrass SDK, AWS Cloud, AWS IoT services, and Amazon Sumerian VR AR uh, client. From the partners, uh, we are using this Gentech Ethernet CPRS LTE CPE, Dell Edge Server, and Oculus VR headset. And overall, this solution is for the industry IoT use cases. Over here, you can see that the, what kind of proof, uh, proof of concept Nokia has been doing already with our multi-access edge computing platform. We have been doing overall uh, uh, 30, and we have picked up like eight, which might be like a most interesting for you. So we have been doing this augmented reality uh, with uh, 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 carrier on, on, on Taiwan. Then we have this car, car to X. This is the ongoing program uh, with the uh, German carrier. Campus LTE, uh, we have been providing a private LTE network on the enterprise. Uh, it's video orchestration. This is for the sport venue. And with solution, uh, we can provide this uh, experience when you are in the sport venue. With the one, one second delay, you can see what is actually happening over there. There's the same kind of services also over the internet. So then you are talking about like a 25 seconds delay. So this is like a huge difference. Then we have a solution for the serverless cameras, object tracking, then virtual reality with the Nokia also camera. This is for the end customers. And then we have a people finder that we were doing with the carrier from Saudi Arabia. Oh, here, so uh, as said that we have, we have this physical proof of concept is available in the builders area. And, and over there, um, our use case is that when you have these this huge ship containers, in, in the current deployments, uh, this uh, connectivity is based on the GSM, and a lot of data is processed over the satellite, which means that uh, there's a, like a, a performance and capacity issue. Now, with our solution, we will build up this end-to-end uh, private LTE network data center and AWS Greengrass data processing inside the, inside the ship, which means possible that even though we, we wouldn't have like uh, uh, internet connectivity, everything is working because we have the whole network in the ship. And we will do this cost saving that that only this um, aggregated data will be sent over the satellite to the main cloud. And network performance is coming that we are using the LTE for the IoT sensors and devices and overall communication inside the ship. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. For those of you who haven't had a chance to get to the Builder Fair, Upstairs, by the way, it's a. I highly recommend you check it out. In fact, I think we've seen. Marco will confirm. 
a couple of customers who saw it and said, yeah, I, I want that. I want to go implement that based on the demo. Uh, so it's really very exciting. So wrapping up, let's, let's just review the story we've been through today. There's a key question that we all have to answer for every use case, every problem we're trying to solve. Where do I want to process my data? Between the edge and the cloud. And AWS provides an expanding and evolving set of tools that you can use to make those choices, all with one common programming model. And Greengrass is at the center of it. Greengrass lets you operate on a gateway or a vehicle or a server appliance or even on wireless infrastructure. And you've seen four examples of that. And we're really excited about the pace of innovation. And we plan to accelerate. So today we talked about new Lambda development languages, machine inference at the edge, local resource access, protocol adapters, including support for OPC UA. Greengrass over the air updates. And we talked about how Greengrass works just great with Amazon Free RTOS for microcontrollers. And finally, we talked about how Greengrass is not only running with new features and getting better, but it is running in an expanding set of environments, in Linux, in Docker containers, and even in VMware. While you're here in Las Vegas, at the rest of the show, there's going to be more sessions and some demos that you can check out if you want to learn more about FreeRTOS and how FreeRTOS and Greengrass work together about machine learning inference at the edge. And you should certainly go check out the, the demos from Nokia and VMware and a demo from Cisco as well that's available and showing some of the cool things that are happening with Greengrass. I want you to enjoy the rest of your time while you're here at reInvent. Thank you very much. <laughs>